The Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal is a country of very old and rich culture and of many ethnic groups and languages. The modern state of Nepal as we know it today used to be a group of many kingdoms until 1768 when one of them, ruled by the king Pridvi Narayan Shah, united the country that will remain a kingdom until 2006, after the end of a civil war. Nepal's evolution of branding. So, um, as some countries have had a few different brand names with different mottos already, so did Nepal. Starting with Nepal for all seasons, focusing on all the tourist activities related to natural beauty and the fact Nepal is a place to visit at any season. Even during the monsoon, the variety of climates due to the different altitudes inside um, of the Himalayan country, one can, uh, can escape the rainy weather for a drier place easily without leaving the country. The second brand was Visit Nepal Year 98, a world of its own, focusing on the huge diversity among, among one same country. The third brand was Mount Everest and more, experience it in, in Nepal. And the fourth brand was Mystical Kingdom, Destination Nepal. And the fifth and current brand is called Naturally Nepal, Once is Not Enough. So I'm going to show you a quick video to begin with. Good one. So I'm, I can now talk about Nepal's current brand. Nepal is branding itself as a country of a great fauna and flora, diverse climates, and an extremely beautiful nature. It brands itself as a land of ancestral, millennium, diverse and very rich cultures, where the very concept of compassion was born. Nepal is a land of wisdom and spirituality, a multicultural land of enlightenment with 123 languages and over 100 ethnic groups. When observing Nepal's brand according to the Anhalt criteria, four of the six points are really respected. Simon Anhalt, for those who don't know him, is an expert when it comes to nation branding. The tradition dictates that Nepali people treat their guests like gods. The culture and the heritage are rich and old, and tourism is really developed since it is the only way for the country to survive, so to say. Indeed, without tourism, the economy of Nepal would condemn its people to live in dismal conditions. Luckily, the country is the tourism capital of South Asia, having 60 years of tourist handling experience, and is one of the few countries whose tourist arrival growth, arrival growth increased by over 10% in the last five years. Nepal has only recently become a land for investors to come, but it proved to be competitive while respecting the environment, and it also proved to be a, a safe and suitable business destination. The two Anhold criteria that I also mentioned before, um, so the two points of them that are not really respected are exports and governments, and especially domestic policy. I'll give you a few examples of renowned exports of Nepal. You have pashminas, rocks, traditional knives, sugar, cigarettes, oil seed, cement, bricks, specialty cheese like yak cheese, Adventure gears, wristwatches, rice, green tea, textile shoes, wood, water, juices, stones, etc. A famous brand would be Sherpa Adventure Gear. The major trading partners are India, China, Japan, Germany, and the USA. Despite the fact it has its role in the world's market, Nepal doesn't export enough and imports too much, and the result is a very poor government. But the major problem goes along with a bad and highly corrupted governance. According to the NGOs, I mean to some NGOs, people, some people at power in China and India, steal most of the profits of the country. For instance, Nepal has huge amounts of raw materials like wood, stones and sugar. In exchange of bribes, 
if you at the top of the pyramid accept to sell the raw materials for a very cheap price to India or China, which in turn will sell it back to the Nepali people for several times the price they could have bought it if the government didn't betray them. In other words, the people at power fill their own pockets while impoverishing their people and enriching the Indian and Chinese governments. The government is extremely bad, as you can guess, uh, if not one of the worst. Public opinion regarding the level of national government competency and fairness is bad. Internationally speaking, the way the government deals with global issues such as justice and poverty is not appreciated. The government is also known to change frequently. It's quite unstable. There are massive riots, and uh, <clears throat> massive and dangerous riots, national strikes sometimes going up to 19 days, which as you can, I mean, you can guess that it's really, really bad for the GDP. Corruption is very high in every government branch, being legislative, executive, or judicial. For example, wins a, a trial, the one who has the biggest bribe to offer to the judge. Policemen often accuse you of committing, of committing some fantasized breach and extort your money in exchange of acquittal. Plus, there are almost no services in the country, no healthcare system, and no school free of charges. Back to the, the strong points. One of the <clears throat> things coming to people's mind when hearing Nepal is the fact it is on the top of the world. Indeed, the government uses it to brand the country. Nepal has more festivals than days in a year, and many of them are highly coveted by both autochtones and tourists. The mainly Hindu society even worships a living goddess, Kumari. 327 peaks are offered for climbing and trekking from among 23 peaks above 6,000 meters. One of them, Mount Annapurna, is listed among the top 100 places, uh, excuse me, is officially the best trail in the world. The top play 8,848 meter high Mount Everest has been listed among the, the top 100 places you need to visit before you die. And entertaining such a trip is incredible and, very dan and a very dangerous challenge. It is something really strong for a human being to be able to say, I've climbed the highest peak on my planet and reached the top of the world. The destination has always stood as Nepal's major tourist draw card and helped to boost the economy of both people and the country. It's also very first, um, the very first thing tourists started coming for before discovering all the other amazing things that we can see in the country. Everest has never failed to win the hearts and soul of adventure trekkers around the world. It's a dream destination of most of the trekkers. Every year, thousands of tourists come to Nepal with a single purpose of getting close to the Mount Everest. People are attracted in walking inside and above the clouds, which is, which is felt like a divine feeling for tourists. As regard mountains in general in Nepal, they offer mountain biking and mountain marathons, attracting even more competitive spirits. Paragliding in the city of Pokhara above the Fewa Lake with a view on the 8,000 meter peak Mount Annapurna is said to be the best paragliding ever, which is attracting hundreds of paragliders each day. Nepal also offers bungee jumping, ultralight aircraft, mountain flight, heli trek, skydiving, rafting, kayaking, canyoning, abseiling, boating, or even fishing. It is said by all the people who visited the country that it is the paradise on earth, but I think you've heard that for many other countries as well. The motto of the current brand, naturally Nepal, once is not enough, is somehow true because people who have been there always come back. People fall in love with the country and going there, once they go there once, they keep on going there. It's never enough. Nepal is one of the richest countries in terms of biodiversity due to its unique geographical position and altitude variation going from 60 meters to 8,000 and almost 9,000 if you count the Everest. These conditions enabled the existence of many rhododendron forests counted in Nepal that tourists come to see. The solitude of the Himalayas, or the mysticism of Nepal, enhanced by the tourism marketing, attracts tourists who will scheme the forests, jungles, and mountains over months, seeking for silence and a collection with nature, the universe, and their inner self. I would like to show you another video showing you some landscapes of Nepal.
I think the sound is gone. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> So I'm not going to show you that video a second time. The images are enough. The country counts three wildlife reserves and three conservation areas and one hunting reserve. National parks such as the Saga Marta Park are famous not only for the incredible views, but also for its yaks you can only find in the Himalayan region and <clears throat> about 3,000 meters, making it a scarcely visible animal. The Chitwan safari can be crossed on the back of an elephant, enabling encounters with many animal species, such as crocodiles, birds, hippopotamuses, rhinoceroses, monkeys, tigers, etc. Nepal is the country where the Yeti lives and where the legendary city of Shangri-La is apparently hidden somewhere. Before the earthquake, and I'm sure everyone has heard about it, it happened last year, there were over 3,000 temples and 1,200 monasteries remaining despite the fact other previous earthquakes occurring in the last hundreds of centuries destroyed much of them. Today, one can only imagine how the cities used to look like a few centuries, hundreds of years ago, um, because there were actually no real paintings or sort of representations to be found. <clears throat> Kathmandu, the capital city, is called the city of temples because it is full of it and is thus very touristic. Ten UNESCO World Heritage sites and, sites and monuments are listed there. And Nepali ancestral architecture, divided into three categories, is unique and precious. Another branding element of Nepal is its army, called the Gorkha soldiers, who defeated the British colonial cannons with simple traditional 
kukuli knives that you can see on the screen. Since then, they are a symbol of bravery, strength, and are recruited in armies worldwide or as bodyguards for VIPs. During the Second World War, the British had a regiment of Gorkas in their ranks and have been a huge cause of trouble for Adolf Hitler, who said himself that he could conquer the world if he had such soldiers. As a following, Nepal is branded as a country that has never been colonized. Last but not least, Buddha, the Awaken, was born in the city of Lumbini in Nepal under the name of Prince Siddhartha between the 6th uh, or 7th century before Christ. This is an extremely good advertising for the country and attracts many people thinking, if I breathe the same air in the same mountain as, as the Buddha, maybe I'll come closer to the truth. So spirituality, spirituality seekers not only come for the mountains, but also for the Buddha and Buddhism. If making a quick SWOT analysis of the country's brand, the strengths on an emotional point of view is how the country makes you feel. As a tourist, you will feel safe, familiar, relaxed, like there is a lot to do and to see, and that the place is multicultural, that things are close and cozy. You will feel a taste for life and locals show simple good-heartedness. How the country makes itself look is international, individual, and different cultured, and it's kind of a balanced mix of history and modernity on a limited space. <clears throat> on a rational point of view, we can also say that the country's strength is gastronomy. The weaknesses are a free, uh, sorry, are a fee paying school, the absence of a healthcare system, the bad shops, the high cost of housing and living, the, uh, the underdeveloped and poorly main, maintained infrastructures. An example of underdevelopment is the unique train of the country which is a, street, a steam train from the Industrial Revolution offered by the British to the Nepali government. Besides, even though the business started flowing, it remains unsophisticated, has a bad quality of environment and culture. Furthermore, the corruption linked to the bad governance paralyzes foreign investors to, um, in maintaining investment in Nepal, and there is migration of educated people outside of the country because there is a lack of employment and also because people simply lost faith and hope in the changing of the government. What can be seen as an opportunity is that, after all, business is still improving, and there is a lot to invest in a country. The central location that Nepal has could act as a strategic point for market expansion across South Asia. Other opportunities are a further tourism development, the high potential for hydropower generation, mineral extraction and infrastructure development, a fertile land with a variety of niche agricultures. There are policies in place for promotion and protection of foreign investment. Evidently, the major threat is political instability. Also, implementation, of <clears throat> implementation or foreign direct investment policies are often distorted by bureaucratic delays, inefficiency, and private sector protectionism policies. There is a threat of a high competition in the future, and unfortunately, a threat of natural disasters, that is to say, earthquakes and landslides. If Nepal wants to reach a successful, consistent, and unique positioning as a nation that involves the country's leading political and business society, it has to readapt its future brand in the face of corruption and potential natural disasters. If Nepal wants companies to expand in a country, it will need them to understand that a country is diverse and that growth strategies must be adapted to each region's needs. Hence the significance of relying on long-term long and cumulative efforts and an integrated marketing and commu communication campaign. Nation branding media relies heavily on mass media as the main channel. Media are passive, usually carrying paid advertisements. This is something Nepal could use, for example, um, the image of these celebrities, like Nepal's first female sportive star, Mira Rai, or Sagar Tapa, captain of the national football team. Following the example of the celebrities, Nepal should use national heroes like soldiers missing in action, feminist activists, or the famous Gorka king who united the many surrounding kingdoms and founded Nepal, he is somehow the founding father of the nation, like 
Maybe we can say Gengis Khan has been for the Mongols or Charles the Great and Clovis for France. The use of street art or photography are possibilities, and I am talking about cultural diplomacy here, and the country holds an international human rights summit, that could be a good thing. It could make bigger international ad campaigns for its disabled protection organizations and create organizations to protect children, women, homosexuals, or the poor. <clears throat> that would show the world that the Nepali government is caring. Nepal could display its green and renewable energy attitude more than it does in the present time, especially if it's not really hard to be green when compared to many big polluting countries. A point can be made on Nepali cinema. Why not a Kaliwood in Kathmandu, for example? Also, an advertisement of the National Cricket Stadium can be made. Nepal has the tallest statue of the Hindu god Shiva of the world. They could use it as a symbol like France uses the Eiffel Tower, for example. In the past, Nepal has been and is still facing trying times. During the civil war, raging from 96 to 2006, the country's brain was totally shut down. And after last year's earthquake, one million buildings were destroyed, including very old monuments. One million buildings is the amount of buildings destroyed in London by the Nazi bombings. Currently, all the businesses are gone, and potential investors won't come out of fear of seeing their infrastructures crumble down. People worldwide believe all the beauty and cultural heritage has vanished, which is, of course, not true. A new motto could be, I mean, ironically, we still have temples, and the next earthquake is only planned for 2,100, come here. But more seriously, Nepal's rebranding must go along with political stability and an uncorrupted government, united with the people, to finally stop a few powerful people from exploiting the country as a colony. If the government gets strong and unites with its people, Situations like the current oil blockade that India is exerting on Nepal won't happen anymore. And Nepal could also display witnesses of people who are fighting against corruption or national heroes who fought and maybe died for the goal during riots or demonstrations. To put it in a nutshell, uh, Nepal's nation bringing strong points are tourism, culture, heritage, people, investment, and immigration. And the weak points are exports and governance. As a result, Nepal is ranked 27th of Asia and 88th globally, according to the Nation Branding Index. Generally speaking, the new brand could focus on Nepalese icons, street arts, local social works, environment, and human rights. We have seen that political instability, potential natural disasters, India and China's exploitation of the government, and a drastically I mean, are drastically damaging the country's brand. The very challenge of tomorrow's brand is to make the country appear earthquake resistant and above all, to get rid of the corruption. And I'm open for your questions, if you have any. Thank you very much, Babu, for this excellent and so interesting presentation. And yes, please, question as comment. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I've also been into Nepal and I've got a very close front from Nepal and we sometimes talk about the level of corruption which is over there. Yes. So I know there is also corruption in our country, of course, to, you know, to a very remarkable level. So when in the corruption, what is the solution? Because the high ranking officials in, let's say, Nepal, they are involved in corruption. So what would be a very practical way for the solution of the corruption? Well, I'm not an expert in the field. And if, I would, if it would be that easy, I think the solutions would have been found already. But what I could suggest is a total transformation of the institutions that would somehow stop, I mean, people from using the power for their own interests. So uh, basically a reform of many institutions, especially the ones about, I mean, in the judicial system, the judicial branch of the government. But otherwise, I, I cannot really tell you. I would love to help the country, but I can just give you facts. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Thank you. 
questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so you spoke about government. Do you think that probably um, working for Nepal as an individual can maybe help straighten the country in a way? Because as you said, um, the country needs branding. And uh, since it has a nice impact on people that come and visit it, maybe these visitors can create a lot of projects there concerning to cultural diplomacy, for example, or rebranding the country, or just showing the true face of this country to the world. Yeah, there is indeed a lot to do to improve the, um, the branding and the reputation outside of the country. Uh, so I, I guess the country should probably need some experts in the field, and cultural diplomats would definitely be a good tool for improving the soft power of the country not to say the nation branding, because it's somehow, it's somehow the same thing. And also, many foreigners go into the country to, in, to open NGOs, but this is more um, destined to help poor people or children who cannot go to school or ill people. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. You mentioned a lot of beautiful aspects of Nepal as well as a lot of trivial aspects. Um, but I wanted to ask you personally, what attracts you the most about Nepal? Is it the culture? Is it the sights? Is it the food? I don't know which is part of culture, but what is it necessarily that attracts you the most to Nepal? Well, the first thing that attracted me into the country is the images I have seen of it on TV or on a computer. And so it definitely the Himalayas, the sights, the hates, everything is amazing. And then when you go into the country, you just discover all the rest, all the other aspects. So of course, the amazing people, the hospitality, the food, like just all the, culture, the whole culture basically. And, and it's also all that Buddhist, um, Buddhist world and spiritual world that is really interesting there because it's really present in the society. And you can really feel kind of, I don't know if that's a good word in English, but wiseness of people living there. Okay. Thank you very much one more time for this really wonderful presentation. And